Hello guys, how are you? This is Dr. Krishna. Hello everyone, Krishna. this is Dr. Shubham. So today we shall be having an integrated session guys. Integrated. So in this integrated session, what we shall be doing is that I will be teaching you uh, the anatomy, right? So in connection with the anatomy, Dr. Shubham will be teaching the surgery part. He will be teaching you everything in the surgery along with the treatment and the scores. Okay. So, hello, Sandili Mahale. Yes, it is about to start, Sandili. Uh, Gopi Raja. Hi, Gopi. Venela. Hi. Video is not clear. Meenakshi Chaukhan. Good evening, Meenakshi. Samir Khan. Hello, Samir Karna. Video is clear. Yeah, is my video clear guys and am I audible to all of you all clear? Thank you. Right, so I think there might be some uh, internet problem. Sandili. Mohammed. Hi Mohammed. How are you? So guys, thank you Dr. Bentect. I am thank you. Thank you so much. Namaskara. Video, video quality is not good. I think video quality is good, right? I think there might be some internet disturbance with you. Karma Gaming, thank you so much. I'm doing well, Karma. Namaskar, Rishi Raj. Namaskar. Thank you, Meenakshi. Even I am very much excited to teach you because, you know, inguinal region and pancreas, they both are very, very important. And I think when I was an MBBS student, uh, the difficult topic which I faced in anatomy in, in the abdominal region is the inguinal region. The inguinal ligament, inguinal canal, you know, the rings and all, they are really, 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 it was very difficult for me. It took months for me, you know, to practice it and have a clear concept on that. So, hi Shubham. Hi. Dr. Benetech. <laughs> right, so shall we start, guys? Shall we start? Shall we start discussing? We shall start on with the pancreas part. Yes, I need your response. Shall we start? Hi, Nandini. So let us start guys, now let us start. Now very important thing you need to know. So let us let us start discussing. Yes, Sherwan, Sherwan Kumavat, it is beneficial for BSc nursing students also because I think even you uh, will have the same subjects as the MBBS students will have with minor uh, changes, right? So it is very important for you also for your exams, right? GNM nursing exams. Thank you, Dilip. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. So let us start, guys. So we shall be first discussing pancreas. Okay. I shall be discussing the anatomy of pancreas in context with your next exam. Okay. In context with the next exam. Now, don't think when I tell next exam, he will be teaching only important points. No. This basics which I am teaching will also be useful for MBBS students as well. Okay. The first, second year students as well. And Dr. Shubham will be teaching the problem with the pancreas that is acute pancreatitis okay he will teach you everything regarding that fine so let us first focus on good evening neeraj good evening let us first focus on pancreas guys all of you know what is pancreas pancreas is you know is it an exocrine gland or endocrine gland or mixed gland yeah pancreas all of you know very good very good very good Meenakshi, very good Muhammad, Muhammad B. Khalaf, very good Yogesh, excellent. So this is a mixed gland, right? So this is a mixed gland. Mixed gland in the sense it has got both exocrine as well as endocrine. Dharan, sir, I am fine, thank you, Dharan. So exocrine and endocrine gland. Now, all of you know where is pancreas located, right? So if you if i if i just make a rough picture guys all of you know concentrate don't comment down just concentrate so if if i take a rough picture of 
your intestine like this i mean the duodenal part right so as you can see the duodenum is u shaped right or the duodenum is c shaped now within this loop of the duodenum within this loop of the duodenum you have got what is called as your pancreas in this way okay now fine you told me what is pancreas where it is located and all right but how will i know for example if a person is standing in front of me and if i have to uh, tell from this level till this level there is pancreas so how will i know what is the topographic anatomy of that the topographic anatomy is pancreas they range all the way from t12 t12 to l3 this is very 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 important from t12 till l3 you have got pancreas okay you know you can palpate your liver right you can palpate if there is splenomegaly you can palpate your spleen also you can palpate your stomach you can palpate your let us say kidneys right but the important thing is that you cannot palpate pancreas you know why because above pancreas there are many organs that are situated right so pancreas is deep inside so that is the reason why pancreas cannot be palpated okay so that is the reason why it is very difficult for us to palpate the pancreas and as a note for a note i'm writing that pancreas is located in c loop of duodenum c loop of duodenum and what are the important mcqs you have covered here the first important mcq we have got here is what is the topographic position right from t12 all the way till l3 second important thing they are going to ask you all of you now all of you look here they are going to ask you where is the head of the pancreas i told you head of the pancreas is located within the loop right now where is the tail of the pancreas look here very carefully now this is the place where you need to concentrate now where is the tail of the pancreas is that this is exact region of the tail of the pancreas right so what i have just drawn guys this picture is the picture of your spleen so the center part of your spleen whatever is there that is called as the hilum of your spleen right so what is that called as that is called as the hilum of your spleen so the tail is directed towards the hilum of your spleen okay so that thing you need to know tail is directed towards the hilum of your spleen okay fine sir uh, i have heard different parts within the pancreas like we have got neck tail body and also can you please explain that look here now all of you this is your c shape beautiful duodenum okay now within this duodenum you have got this thing all the way like this this is how the pancreas is Osama Sheikh, good evening, Osama. Good evening. So this is how the pancreas is, guys. Right now, in this, we have got quite different parts here. You see this? This part is called as the head of the pancreas. Okay, and this part below the head here, you can see this is called as the uncinate process of the pancreas. Uncinate process. Okay, and after that, you can see this part. This is called as the neck of the pancreas. Khan Amin, good evening Khan. And next you have got the body. And finally, this end part is called as the tail of the pack. Okay. So these are the important things which you need to know. So, so far you have to learn, you have learned where is the head located, where is the tail located. You have also learned it is located in between T12 to L3. Third thing you have learned is the parts. Now, all of you, hi Sanyasi. So should I stop? Sanyasi, should I stop? Good evening. Good evening, Fatima Anjum. Thank you so much, Fatima. Thank you so much. Right, guys. Now, what they ask you in the exam, definitely, regarding the pancreas. What they ask you in the exam is that they don't ask you what is head, what is uncinate process, what is neck and tail. But what they ask you is that they ask you regarding the anterior relations, anterior relations of pancreas, 
at the same time they will also ask you about the posterior relations of pancreas it means in front of the pancreas what are the structures that are present in back of the pancreas what are the structures that are present so what are the anterior relations of pancreas can anyone tell any one anterior relation of pancreas anyone before i draw the picture here so in the meanwhile i'll be drawing the picture yes so this would be your beautiful pancreas like this right this is your pancreas look here all of you all of you all of you what are the parts that are located nearer to this yes stomach obviously stomach is there right just behind the stomach we have got our pancreas yes very good very good prakash right so all of you look here you know you know this very important thing we have got something called as colon right so what is this part of the colon which i'm drawing guys which is going up this is called as the ascending colon and now i'm drawing another part of the colon all the way like this look here all the way this is called as a transverse colon so can i tell so can i tell transverse colon is one of the relation can i write it down point number one transverse colon Point number one would be transverse colon. Very good, cyanide. Very good, Meenakshi. Very good. Second important thing. Second important thing is that we have got a layer of omentum. Right? So, if you can look here, this part of the omental membrane or the omentum, you call it as transverse mesocolon. So, this green part. This green part is called transverse mesocolon. Okay? So, the second one is your transverse mesocolon. Third and the fourth important thing, guys, very, very, very important. All of you look here now. All of you have to concentrate here. What is that? You have got an artery that is passing. Okay, let me change another color. You have got an artery, a pink color artery, let us say. This is passing all the way down here and passing over the duodenum like this right in the same way you have also got a vein that is coming down all the way right it is passing in this manner over the duodenum like this so what is this artery and what is this vein guys can anyone tell me yes no not gastroduodenal duren side Excellent. Karthishwaran. Karthishwaran, excellent. Anushka saying good evening. Karthishwaran, excellent. It is superior mesenteric artery. Very good. This is superior mesenteric artery. Very good, cyanide. Very good, Dr. Bendik. And this is superior mesenteric vein. Right. So we have got two arteries. One is called as superior mesenteric artery as well as superior mesenteric vein. So, superior mesenteric artery and superior mesenteric vein. So, these are some of the anterior relations of your pancreas. Anterior relations of your pancreas. Okay. Now, can you please draw the posterior relations of pancreas? Can anyone tell what are the posterior relations of pancreas? Anyone? Yeah. Very good, Gopi Raja. Yes, it was superior mesenteric artery. Very good. Now tell me, what are the posterior relations? So I'm just turning the duodenum back. I'm looking at the duodenum from the posterior view in this way. Okay, so this is the posterior side. Very good, very good. Gopi Raja has commented. Gopi Raja has commented, right? It is inferior vena cava. Excellent, Gopi Raja. See, Pandit, they, they actually travel, it is not that important to know, but they actually travel adjacent to it. Superior mesenteric, superior mesenteric is a vessel. Superior mesenteric is an artery, it is a vessel. Okay, very good, Osama Sheikh, it is inferior vena cava. Right, but anyways, let us get back to the topic here. All of you, 
so this is the pancreas which we have got here right this is the pancreas like this right and this is the place where you have got a vein all the way like this now this vein is called as portal vein so some of you have mentioned that portal vein will be anterior no but portal vein is the posterior side okay so portal vein will be your posterior relation it forms your posterior relation like this okay so it is coming down the portal vein is actually coming down from the uncinate process you see this is called as uncinate process right so from the loop of this uncinate process it is coming down second important thing so let me write it down the first important thing is your portal vein okay second important thing second important thing is that there is a vein all the way here which is going down like this now this vein is called as inferior vena cava as most of you already answered it right so this is called as inferior vena cava second one is called as inferior vena cava okay and the last and the third one here you have got a duct which is coming down all the way like this this duct is called as bile duct what is this duct called as this duct is called as bile duct bile duct right guys so have you understood the important things here before i go to the clinical point have you understood the anterior and posterior relation so far clearly without any doubt yes i want a green signal I'm on a green signal so that I can continue it. Very good, right. Now, now let me discuss one very, very and very important point. Very, very, very important point, guys. All of you, all of you should concentrate here. All of you should concentrate here. Now, don't make any notes, okay? So if you look at if you look at the duodenum guys all of you look here if you look at the duodenum this is this is how this is how your duodenum is present so this is your loop of duodenum isn't it or this is a c shaped duodenum like this okay now this duodenum has got four parts this is the first part this is the second part this is the third part and this is the fourth part okay yes anushka even for nursing yes first part is called as the upper horizontal part right first part is called upper horizontal part coming to the third part third part should be called as lower horizontal part so the third part is called lower horizontal part and now look here from one how do you go to two you descend down all the way till two so the second part is called as the descending part and how do you go to four you ascend all the way up so the fourth part is called as ascending part of the duodenum very good osama sheikh superior descending horizontal ascending right so superior horizontal descending inferior horizontal ascending okay now on the other hand let me you know put up the liver over here let me put up the liver over here okay now all of you concentrate here all of you concentrate here within the liver we have got two important ducts okay two important ducts what are these two important ducts this is called as right hepatic duct. We have also called as left hepatic duct. What are they? Right hepatic duct, left hepatic duct. Okay. Right and left hepatic duct, together they form common hepatic duct. What do they form? Common hepatic duct. Okay. Now, all of you know, behind the liver, you have got, what is this which stores the bile here? Right. So, this is your this is your gallbladder right so this is your gallbladder now what is the duct that is coming out of the gallbladder can anyone comment below for me what is the duct that is coming out of the gallbladder guys yes anushka i can even teach physiology in this how the cck is released how the bile is released how it acts, how it emulsifies the fat, but this is an anatomy clause. So I'll be completely focusing on the anatomical structures. Okay. When I'll be discussing physiology of that, then there 
uh, in my recorded questions there will be physiology very good vanilla it is district that prayas excellent sandili excellent and sanyasi pandit excellent right so this is your cd cd means cystic duct now look here common hepatic duct and cystic duct together they join together and form a duct and that is called as common bile duct very good osama sheik excellent common bile duct okay now all of you leave this all of you leave this concept here now come back to another concept now what is that another concept is that all of you know you have got your pancreas over here let us say this is your pancreas like this okay now within your pancreas within your pancreas you have got ducts isn't it within your pancreas let me use another color that is red within your pancreas you have got ducts like this right so this duct which i'm drawing right now this is called as the main pancreatic duct it is called as the main pancreatic duct now this main pancreatic duct look here all the way like this all of you now should concentrate now all the way this duct which i'm uh, slashing down with this green sketch over here this is called as the main pancreatic duct what is this main pancreatic duct then what is that which is left over that is called accessory pancreatic duct okay accessory pancreatic duct now all of you look here very good osama sheik very good i'll be telling you right now right very good so osama sheik is telling that the main pancreatic duct is also called as duct of virsan excellent and accessory pancreatic duct is called as duct of santorini okay duct of santorini so we have got this duct called as main pancreatic duct okay main pancreatic duct this is also called as duct of virsan duct of virsan and we have also got something called as accessory pancreatic duct this is called as your accessory pancreatic duct which is also called as duct of santorini duct of santorini right so this can also be an mcq guys this is very very important don't confuse don't confuse virsang with you know santorini and all okay accessory you know it sounds like s s means santorini so remember in that way okay now look here all of you all of you should pay attention now common bile duct is coming all the way and this common bile duct passes behind the duodenum this common bile duct passes behind the duodenum and joins like this look here very carefully this is joining in this way okay this is joining in this way and it is opening out in this way so what is happening common bile duct is joining with the main pancreatic duct so common bile duct is joining with the mpd mpd stands for main pancreatic duct so what will happen when common bile duct will join with the main pancreatic duct anyone anyone what will happen if common pan common bile duct will join with the main pancreatic duct what duct is formed here excellent Karthiswaran, Karthiswaran has already answered it is excellent, excellent, hepatopancreatic duct, hepatopancreatic duct. Now all of you look on the hepatopancreatic duct, on the surface of hepatopancreatic duct, you have got a small sphincter, okay, you have got a small sphincter there on the surface of hepatopancreatic duct. Now this sphincter is called as sphincter of audi dharan sai has already commented that it is sphincter of audi excellent dharan sai karthishwaran very good this is sphincter of audi okay now look here now look here this was the thing which i drew right so this color whatever i'm drawing here this violet color or whatever it is this is called a sphincter of body now what is the name of this opening opening is called as hepatopancreatic ampulla 
this is called as hepato pancreatic ampulla okay now why are you telling us about hepato pancreatic ampulla why are you going much more detailed in all of this why because if there is a tumor that is formed near the hepato pancreatic ampulla like this right if there is a tumor that is formed here do you think the bile will be released into the duodenum no do you think the fat will be digested no then what will happen undigested fat will be excreted out you call that condition as steteria right so everything whatever i'm telling you is in relation with the clinical part okay next important thing next important thing is that all of you all of you guys all of you yes someone is already answering that it is also called ampulla of waiter yes hepatopancreatic ampulla is also called as ampulla of waiter ampulla of waiter excellent and thank you so much for reminding me okay now look here within your mouth you have got papilla through which what within your mouth you have got papilla so in the same way on the duodenal wall also you have got papilla okay on the wall of duodenum also you have got papilla look here very carefully so this papilla whatever i have drawn here there are actually two let me also draw one more papilla over here you see there is one papilla on the top there is one papilla on the bottom so all of you might think the papilla which is on the top is called superior duodenal papilla because it is superior but the reality is that the top one is called as inferior duodenal papilla right so this papilla over here this is called as inferior duodenal papilla and the lower papilla here it is called as superior duodenal papilla superior duodenal papilla you also call it as major papilla of the duodenum major papilla of the duodenum you know why all of you remember this thing guys it is not based upon where is the position it is always based upon where the pancreatic duct is opening if the pancreatic duct would have opened above then that would have been called as superior duodenal papilla but you know fortunately pancreatic duct is opening i mean the main pancreatic duct that is opening below so you call that it as superior duodenal papilla so these are some of the important things you need to know yes shriyas it is major duodenal papilla shriyas you are right now after having said this dr shubham will tell all the clinical points which are related with this okay now let me go on to another point let me go on to another important thing okay all of you now concentrate here all of you this this thing which i'm drawing right now this thing which i'm drawing right now this is called as iota so what iota it is present in the abdomen so i call it as abdominal iota. next important thing exactly side to it i have got something called as inferior vena cava ivc inferior vena cava now inferior vena cava actually there are two veins which drain into inferior vena cava okay so there is a vein that is coming all the way like this on the right side this is called as what is this vein now you will tell me the name of this vein when i draw this part over here this is called as right renal vein now look here all the way and here you have got here you have got another renal vein and this renal vein is called as the left renal vein what is this renal vein left renal vein so this is called as the left renal vein this is called as a right renal vein very good all of you now look here don't make any notes now don't make any notes so usually the left renal uh, renal vein is longer in comparison with the right renal vein okay now later on in the topics guys later on whenever i will be teaching you the abdomen i will be telling you one thing that we have got a point called as l1 okay from this l1 there is an artery here there is an artery at the level of l1 and that artery is called as superior mesenteric artery 
superior mesenteric artery okay now that superior mesenteric artery now pay attention all of you pay attention this superior mesenteric artery passes over the inferior vena cava all the way like this okay it passes over the inferior vena cava all the way like this okay now what is happening see this is my left renal vein okay this is my left renal vein on the back what do i have on the back side i have iota and in the front side what do i have i have got superior mesenteric artery so i think this will be the correct picture on the back i have got iota and in the front i have got superior mesenteric artery now in between both of them i have got my left renal vein so what will happen is that sometimes the left renal vein might be compressed right between this superior mesenteric artery and iota both of them can compress the left renal vein so as a result what will happen what will happen is that the pressure within the left renal vein will increase and that is what is called as what renal hypertension okay so in this case in this case right the left renal vein compression will lead to renal hypertension all of you understood this all of you understood yeah Okay. Now, this syndrome, whatever I have just explained to you, this is called as nutcracker syndrome. This is called as nutcracker syndrome. Nutcracker syndrome. Very, 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 very high yield, guys. Keep this thing in mind. Okay. Just fix it in your mind. Very, very high yield. And I want to close the discussion. I want to just close the discussion of this pancreas i think we have discussed everything about the pancreas i just want to close this discussion of the pancreas by just telling the arterial supply guys okay by just telling the arterial supply look here all of you all of you yes yes daran sai it is different from portal hypertension it is different from portal hypertension portal hypertension you see in case of liver cirrhosis okay where liver is not ready to take the blood so it will push back the blood into the portal vein tomorrow in the morning again the liver will push back the blood into the portal vein day after tomorrow again it will push back into the portal vein so as a result the portal vein blood gets accumulated that is called as portal hypertension okay but whatever it is uh one two three what are these three things we have got an artery called as splenic artery splenic artery now this splenic artery will give some branches okay the splenic artery will give some branches and those branches will supply to your pancreas second artery is superior pancreato duodenal artery and when i tell superior there will also be inferior so the third one will be inferior pancreato duodenal artery so these are the three arteries which supply to your pancreas okay so can you please draw them when i'll be teaching you abdomen as i have already started abdominal series right so when i'll be teaching you abdomen the next topics i mean the next session i'll be teaching you all the arterial systems within your abdomen that time i'll draw each and every artery okay i'll make it clear but for now you just have to remember it has got superior pancreatic duodenal inferior pancreatic duodenal as well as the splenic branches right uh, yes the god of surgery <laughs> Deshra Chaudhary, thank you. Yeah, Dr. Shubham will be teaching now. Yeah, thank you for the comment. Right. So now, Dr. Shubham will teach everything that is related. Uh, this is the normal anatomy. So what is abnormal? He'll be teaching you right now. Right. So let us start uh, surgery now. Shall we integrate this entire thing which I've discussed with the surgery? Are you ready, guys? So welcome back guys. I hope I'm I'm audible. Please let me know whether I'm audible or not. Andili, thank you, thank you so much. 
ओके 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 थैंक यू थैंक यू ओके सो अ वेरी गुड इवनिंग गाइस अगेन सो नाउ डॉक्टर कृष्णा आई हैव एक्सप्लेन ब्यूटीफुली अबाउट द पैंक्रियाटिक नॉट मी बेसिकली राइट अबाउट द ब्लड सप्लाई ऑफ द पैंक्रियाज एंड अबाउट द एंटीरियर एंड द पोस्टीरियर रिलेशन ऑफ द पैंक्रियाज राइट ओके सो इफ यू टॉक अबाउट दिस पैंक्रियाज बेसिकली राइट इफ यू टॉक अबाउट दिस पैंक्रियाज नाउ देर आर मेनी रीजन्स देर आर मेनी रीजन्स विच कैन कॉज द इन्फ्लेमेशन ऑफ दिस पैंक्रियाज राइट सो what are the reasons which can cause the inflammation in this particular pancreas which we will be talking about but first of all let us know what is the pancreatitis right now basically if you talk about pancreatitis basically this is simply the inflammation of the pancreas right this is the inflammation of the pancreas pancreatitis itis means the last suffix which is which we are adding with the pancreas that itis means the inflammation right and that itis suffix if you will be adding to any particular medical terminology terminology then it will become the inflammation of that particular part so pancreatitis means pancreas inflammation fine now basically it is having two types acute and the chronic pancreatitis right but i will be focusing mainly on the acute pancreatitis first right so we are beginning with the acute pancreatitis guys okay so let's begin with the acute pancreatitis acute pancreatitis okay so acute pancreatitis very simple this is the basically inflammation of the pancreas right inflammation of the pancreas now usually very commonly they ask you this is a very common question what is the most common cause of acute pancreatitis and usually it is uh, you know confusing among the students why is it so because uh, you know however if you will see the reasons of the pancreatitis the causes which are causing the pancreatitis there are many okay there is a long list for that but the two are the most common causes right one is the gallstone right that can cause the pancreatitis we are calling that as gallstone induced pancreatitis second second one is the alcohol consumption right as we know that is very very common among the population right so two are the most common reasons so usually the examiners are trying to confuse you with the most common cause of acute pancreatitis right because in some books they have mentioned about the alcohol consumption also that is the most common cause but that is not the right thing what you need to answer in the exam exams are that is the gallstone induced pancreatitis right so gallstones are the most common cause for the acute pancreatitis that is the very first question which you need to remember as far as acute pancreatitis is concerned right so a very first question that is our what is the most common cause guys most common cause mcc means most common cause of acute pancreatitis that you will answer as gallstones first of all right first doubt is clear if they will ask you for an example if they will ask you second most common cause right for an example second most common cause then in that case you will be answering that as alcohol right then you will be answering that as alcohol other than that we are having several causes of the acute pancreatitis right so i will just not waste the time by writing all of those just look over here for example here you can see if we are don't if we are not knowing about the cause that will be the idiopathic simply otherwise gallstone that is the most common cause i told you then the ethanol consumption or the alcohol consumption that can be the cause then you know trauma trauma would be okay trauma i will be writing over here right usually the blunt trauma okay the blunt trauma to the abdomen blunt trauma to the abdomen that is the most common cause for acute pancreatitis in the children right that is most common cause in the children right usually for an example uh, how the cases are actually coming to the casualty right coming to the hospital okay so if a child of let's say 10 to 12 years of age okay or 14 years of age these kind of a uh, child if, if they are coming to the casualty right they will be actually giving the history of you know they were riding the bicycle and by riding the bicycle they met with the accident and basically what could have been happened that the handle of the bicycle right the handle of the bicycle might have actually hit into the abdominal region right and due to that they might develop the acute pancreatitis okay they might develop okay there is a possibility that acute pancreatitis might not be happening but that is usually the most common cause in children because if you talk about the children age group 
right they are not very predisposed to the gallstone development or they are not consuming the alcohol actually right so these are not the causes in the children age group mainly however if they are asking you on a broader picture what is the most common cause you will be answering gallstone as an answer okay now other causes are like for example if some kind of person uh, is on prolonged use of the steroids then mums can cause that autoimmune uh, could be the other cause scorpion stings however it is very rare right other than that hypercalcemia hypertriglyceridemia okay i will be mentioning them uh, later as well then the ercp itself right ercp itself can cause the acute pancreatitis however i will mention that ercp we are using this diagnostic modality for uh, you know knowing the acute pancreatitis okay or even the treatment of the uh, you know stones in the cbd we are using the ercp for that as well but if the repeated use of ercp uh, will be done for some particular patient then it can uh, you know itself cause acute pancreatitis right then uh, some kind of particular drugs can cause the acute pancreatitis right mainly the thiazide diuretics might cause that or the metronidazole uh, uses can cause that particular uh, acute pancreatitis right however okay so these are some uh, particular causes sometimes they ask you okay and uh, very commonly they might ask you uh, the most common cause that is a gallstone most common cause in children that will be the blunt trauma to the abdomen right okay yes very nice Mohammed just said I get smashed okay get smashed is the mnemonic for remembering okay for remembering this so I get I get smashed okay so you can remember with this mnemonic the causes of acute pancreatitis however top three would be enough to remember for the exams right okay now I'm guys moving on to the further picture of the acute pancreatitis that is the clinical feature that is the most important part of this particular session that is the clinical features of the acute pancreatitis right so guys how clinical features are very easy to understand right uh, look just imagine that you are in a hospital okay you are in a hospital and the patient comes to you now you don't know this patient is having acute pancreatitis or something else right the, the patient what will be the symptoms how you can identify this patient is having acute pancreatitis or might have acute pancreatitis so first of all patient will be compl complaining of the pain in this particular area right pain in this particular area and this area is called as the epigastric region right so the patient will be complaining of the epigastric pain right so first of all so what are the clinical features guys okay right so clinical features of acute pancreatitis fine okay it is not crcp it is the ercp okay i will tell you it is actually the endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography i will tell about this okay just it is ercp okay fine i will tell about this so clinical features guys clinical features would be first of all epigastric pain epigastric region pain, right epigastric pain and that is usually radiating to the back the patient will be saying i am having a pain over here in this area okay and that pain will be the sensitivity of that pain right the in, uh, intensity of that pain will be very very high and usually the patient will be having the one particular kind of position right they will be actually putting their hand on the epigastric region and they will be bending forward they will be bending forward that much pain will be there and this bending forward right they have compared this sign with the muhammad prayer sign right with the muhammad prayer i mean the, the uh, like the muslim community they are doing their prayers like this okay by bending forward so they have just compared this with that particular scenario so this particular bending forward uh, sign is also called as basically the muhammad prayer sign okay fine so epigastric pain that will be radiating to the back region so pain will be here they will be bending forward and this pain will be going in the back region right this this pain will be going in the back region okay so epigastric pain radiating in nature right that would be radiating in nature fine okay osama namaz yeah like that like that so uh, that's why they are calling that as uh, which sign that is the muhammad prayer sign okay fine okay now uh peri umbilical abdominal pain dr benedict gray and cullen sign i will talk about these signs guys okay just wait for uh, some moment okay fine okay now okay says the sign of sama okay okay now next point epigastric pain is done okay next point this pain will be radiating to the back basically okay and the patient will be actually relieved by this position that i told you fine so that is the thing along with that the patient might have nausea the patient might have 
वॉमिटिंग ओके द पेशेंट माइट हैव रिपीटेडली हिकअप्स पेशेंट माइट हैव रिपीटेडली हिकअप्स ओके द पेशेंट विल बी एक्चुअली यू नो गेटिंग बेटर ओके दे विल बी एक्चुअली अटेनिंग दिस पोजिशन सो दे विल बी बैंडिंग फॉरवर्ड दे विल बी बैंडिंग फॉरवर्ड इन ऑर्डर टू रिलीव दिस पेन ओके इन ऑर्डर टू रिलीव पेन दे विल बी बैंडिंग फॉरवर्ड ओके एंड आई टोल्ड यू द साइन एज वेल दैट इज द मोहम्मद प्रेयर साइन ओके दैट्स वॉट दे हैव मैंशन इन द बुक्स मोहम्मद प्रेयर साइन साइन ओके मूविंग फॉरवर्ड फ्रॉम हेयर गाइज ओके समटाइम्स इन हाउ एवर दिस इज नॉट वेरी कॉमन समटाइम्स इफ द पैंक्रेटाइटिस फीचर्स आर बिकमिंग और द पैंक्रेटाइटिस इज वेरी वेरी सीवियर इन द पेशेंट समटाइम्स दे माइट प्रेजेंट यू विद द साइंस ऑफ पेरिटोनाइटिस ऑल्सो right however peritonitis is a different topic but sometimes they might present they might present in the casualty with the peritonitis features also for example there could be rebound tenderness right there could be rebound tenderness there could be you know the guarding in this particular area okay i will tell you i will uh, when i will talk about the peritonitis i will explain all the features over there but it is not very common in the acute peritonitis usually the patients are having the epigastric pain that will be radiating towards the back the patient will be having the special position that is the they are actually bending forward yes muslim prayer position yes so that is the case okay fine now i'm just moving further over here okay and now let's talk about what will be the signs you will be seeing in this particular patient for example dr uh, benedict I had mentioned about the gray and colon signs, so let's talk about them as well. So okay, so now let's talk about the signs in these particular patient of acute pancreatitis. Okay, so what will be the signs over here? Signs will be like, uh, first of all, that will be the, uh, first of all, let me just talk about the systemic signs. Okay, what about the vitals of this patient? Vitals will be like the patient BP usually will be on the lower side over here. So if the patient BP is on the lower side, what we are calling that as hypo. tension so bp will be on the lower side now guys you just tell me if the bp is on the lower side what will happen to the heart rate okay if the bp of the patient is on the lower side that is the hypotension now why okay what will happen to the heart rate of such patient right is it bradycardia or is it tachycardia okay is it bradycardia or tachycardia if the patient is having hypotension usually okay dharan sai very nice very nice osama very nice this is tachy very good so this is tachycardia nandini tachycardia okay very 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 nice okay cyanide tachycardia very nice krishna tachycardia very nice so guys yes so heart rate will be on the on the above side so that is the tachycardia and usually we are calling that as reflex tachycardia because what will happen the patient bp will be on the lower side right so as a compensation part the heart rate will be actually the body will try to increase the heart rate right so that is tachycardia and along with that you will see increase in the respiratory rate as well that is tachypnea okay that is tachypnea that is about the vitals okay what you can expect in the vitals basically right what will happen to the respiratory rate heart rate and what will happen to the bp that is the thing which you can expect right now second point over here these are the signs and these signs are loved by the examiners right that's why they are tested very very commonly so i'm starting with that first sign which i'm going to tell you that is the gray turner sign right gray turner sign. okay gray turner sign so sec third sign i will be explaining them okay one more sign i'm just mentioning over here that is the cullen sign okay that is the cullen sign okay and third sign uh, next sign which i am mentioning that is the fox sign fox sign okay so i am just adding the picture so that you can easily understand them okay for example look over here okay fine so what we can see over here if you are seeing that in the flank region in the flank region there is a discoloration there is a bluish reddish kind of discoloration in the flank region okay then this sign is called as the gray turner sign this sign is also called as the gray turner sign so this sign actually what you can see over here guys you can see that on the flank region basically these are the flank region right here you will be seeing the reddish bluish kind of discoloration that is the gray turner sign in the cullen sign what you are seeing in the periumbilical area 
right in the periamblical area if you are seeing the bluish discoloration that is termed as the cullen sign so here what we can see in the periamblical area you can see the you can see the bluish kind of discoloration or a uh, reddish kind of discoloration right Fox sign you will be seeing in the patient. Okay, however, this is not asked very commonly. Fox sign usually gray turner sign and the current signs are asked very commonly. But fox sign, if you will see below the umbilical ligament, usually if the discoloration is seen, basically that is the fox sign. Okay, now the thing is, if you are seeing that uh, these signs actually, if the patient is coming to the casualty, if you are seeing these kind of things, then already you are late in making your diagnosis. Why is it so, guys? Because now this is the case of hemorrhagic pancreatitis what do i mean by that it means the pancreas first of all the pancreas started with the inflammation and now the patient presentation now the patient presentation is actually coming late to you the patient is the patient might be coming late to you so in this case the pancreas is already having the hemorrhage if the pancreas is already having the hemorrhage means pancreas is bleeding right now that's why this kind of discoloration this that's why this kind of discoloration is actually seen in the patient right so if you are seeing these kind of signs right first of all if the patient is coming we should not wait for looking these signs first of all right because these are the signs of hemorrhagic pancreatitis these are the signs for hemorrhagic pancreatitis okay hemorrhagic pancreatitis so if these signs you are not seeing in your patient that doesn't mean that you have ruled out the pancreatitis right it's just that this is not the hemorrhagic pancreatitis however it could be the acute pancreatitis right very nice very nice achemosis parenchymal region okay okay cullen sign will be positive yes you will see the cullen sign in the acute pancreatitis with that gray turner sign and the fox sign can also be seen okay and over here i'm just mentioning one more thing i'm just mentioning one more thing that in some patients, in some patient, however, pleural effusion can be seen. That is in the severe cases, you can see the left sided very commonly. However, it can be seen in the right side also, but left sided is very common. Left sided pleural effusion, left sided pleural effusion can be seen. Okay. So guys, till now, are you guys clear? Just let me know. Are you guys clear till now? What about the, like, how about the signs and all? Okay. And the difference between the gray turner sign and the cullen sign. Are you guys clear with that? Okay, okay, fine. Okay, Dr. Benedict, Dr. Benedict, yes, okay. Okay, guys, thank you. Okay. Now let's move further, guys. Now let's talk about these are about the signs and all, right? And I told you these signs are seen in the hemorrhagic pancreatitis, right? So we should not wait ideally to wait for these signs. We can't wait actually, we can't afford that. So that's why what are other parameters to diagnose acute pancreatitis, right? Okay. So I have talked about the clinical features and we have talked about some signs over there, which are very uh, important for the examination purpose. Now we are moving on to the very important part that is how to make the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, right? By the help of some investigations, right? So let's talk about that as well. So now we are going to talk about the diagnosis part that how to make the diagnosis right how to make the diagnosis as far as acute pancreatitis is concerned right so what we can see over here in the diagnosis part first of all i told you abdominal pain will be there so that will be in your mind that the patient will be having epigastric region pain right now please remember the patient should not be presenting with any other pain for example the patient is saying that i am having right lower quadrant pain okay the patient will not say right lower quadrant but if you are seeing that patient is actually uh, you know pointing the finger towards the right lower quadrant then it might be pancre it, it might not be pancreatitis rather it might be appendicitis right so the patient should be actually telling you the pain over here in the epigastric region right in the general scenario so epigastric pain will be there epigastric pain okay epigastric Pleural effusion, pleural effusion is actually when the fluid is actually accumulating in the pleural space, right? We will talk about that in the respiratory uh, surgery as well. Okay, so pleural effusion basically uh, around the lungs we are having the pleura. If the extra amount of fluid is at getting accumulating in that pleural space, that is called as the pleural effusion. Okay, right. Fine. Okay. Now, second, so epigastric pain, the patient will be having epigastric pain. Second, very important sign is that you will be actually going for the serum amylase and the lipase test. Okay, you will be actually taking the help of two investigations. One is serum amylase and another one is the 
serum lipase okay in the serum lipase actually it is the most sensitive test it is the most sensitive test and if you talk about the serum lipase it is most specific test right it is more specific test now why we are saying that uh, actually serum amylase is more sensitive because usually if the patient let's say the patient is presenting to you very initially in the initial phase right let's say in the very initial phase the patient present present to you in that case you will be seeing that serum amylase levels are high in the blood of this particular person but if the patient is coming late to you then in those cases serum lipase will be much more high in the in these kind of scenarios right so initially serum amylase level will be high and later on the serum lipase level will be high so momba said that epigastric pain is relieved by leading forward yes yes that is that would be the presentation okay so amylase lipase you will be checking and usually these amylase lipase both of them okay both of them they will be actually they will be actually increasing more than or equal to three fold or more than or equal to three times okay for example 25 to 50 is the normal range for example or 25 to 30 is the normal range but in that case you know three times or even four times or even 10 times we are seeing in the hospitals that some patient are actually having the 400 serum amylase and let's say 350 is the serum lipase right so even 10 10 times serum amylase lipase can be seen in the patient okay now if you will say i'm having serum amylase and i'm having serum lipase okay now among these if i need to compare which one is best so i will say serum lipase is the best because serum amylase can be elevated in some other conditions also okay if you talk about only the serum amylase then it can be raised in other conditions also for example serum amylase can be raised serum amylase can be raised in pancreatic conditions yes we know that it, it can be raised in the pancreatic condition but other than that other than other than that it can be raised in other kind of abdominal problems other abdominal problems for example even in the cholecystitis even in the appendicitis it can be raised so amylase amylase is not a very uh, you know is not a very important sign if you talk about the pancreatitis but if you are seeing the serum lipase levels are high then obviously it is actually indicating towards the acute pancreatitis diagnosis right so other abdominal problems okay or even the non pancreatic conditions so there are several several conditions which can actually uh, raise the serum amylase levels okay fine so serum lipase levels are very very important that is also the mcq okay that is also the mcq fine so what is the level of, what is the relation of amylase and lipase with the pancreatic problem because what happens is that you know if the pancreas is getting disturbed due to any reason there could be trauma there could be uh, gallstones which are disturbing the pancreas there could be alcohol which is disturbing the pancreas so what happens is that you know actually the trypsin level first of all trypsinogen actually will be actually activating the trypsin and due to that it will be uh, you know activating the inflammatory process in the pancreas and due to that the enzymes of the pancreas you will be seeing in the blood right so amylase lipase basically we are talking about the pancreatic enzymes so they will be raised in they will be coming in the blood circulation so automatically they will be raised actually right then i will be i i had actually compared the amylase and the lipase so i said that amylase can be raised in other conditions also okay it can be raised in acute pancreatitis but there are several other conditions also so serum lipase will only be increased in the pancreatitis so that's why serum lipase became more specific test okay which i can rely upon third point over here is if we are finding both the things epigastric pain the patient is actually leaning forward second thing amylase lipase levels are raised in the blood circulation then i am getting the clean sheet that i can diagnose this case as acute pancreatitis if in case i couldn't found one case over here i i am seeing that epigastric pain is there patient is actually relieving forward bending forward actually to relieve the pain but amylase lipase levels are normal in the blood circulation in that case i am not sure that this patient is having acute pancreatitis in that in that scenario i can take the help of imaging i can take the help of radiology i can take the help of x-ray in that case or the ct scan in that case right if i will be going for the ct scan then in this case i will be running the contrast enhanced ct scan okay so in this case i i might take the help of radiology so I might go for the radiology, rather I should say over here, X-ray, okay, 
X-ray or CECT. Okay, and if I am looking something over there, if some findings I am seeing in the X-ray or CECT, I will be talking about those radiological signs as well. Then in that case, I can again confirm that this is acute pancreatitis because in some cases, uh, however, it is very rare that lipase levels are normal in the acute pancreatitis, but in some cases it might be there. Okay, fine. So now I am going to talk about basically that how the radiological signs are actually playing their roles. Okay, so with that you can remember some more signs over here. So I told you whatever things I have just told you, told you just now that is apigastric pain, amylase lipase levels in the blood circulation and third thing was the axial CECT. Okay, any two out of three, right? Any two out of three, any two out of three, if you are seeing in your patient, any two out of three signs if you are seeing in this patient, then you can make your diagnosis for acute pancreatitis okay any two out of three fine when you will take the help of third one only when when you are not satisfied with the first and second if you are satisfied already with the first and second if you are seeing in the patient first and second signs have been met in the patient then you will not take the help of x CCT. okay that would be unnecessary for the patient right because you will be giving the radiation to the patient unnecessarily so we don't want that if you are satisfied with the first second first two signs then it is enough for making the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis investigation of choice ect ct abdomen yes that is contrast and then ct scan cect abdomen is the investigation of choice Dalit moria right okay dr benedict dr benedict said mrcp is good i guess yeah mrcp uh, can be actually uh, taken uh, for the diagnosis part but usually we are doing the ERCP basically because ERCP is both diagnostic and therapeutic okay and MRCP is only diagnostic okay fine pain management I will talk about that I will talk about that so just now we have talked about the signs important signs that how we can make the diagnosis of the acute pancreatitis along with that what I can expect in the patients I can expect the patient will be having the hyperglycemia usually the patient will be having hyperglycemia okay along with that a patient will be having look i told you one of the reason for causing the acute pancreatitis one of the cause of acute pancreatitis was your was your hypercalcemia okay hypercalcemia hyperglycemia okay these are the causes but now i'm saying due to this hypercalcemia due to this hypercalcemia there could be the hypocalcemia later on so hypocalcemia is a complication of acute pancreatitis very important question they will usually okay they will usually ask that which of the following is not a complication of acute pancreatitis and hypercalcemia will be one of the option over there so you need to mark that option hypercalcemia is the is one of the cause of acute pancreatitis but hypocalcemia is the complication why is it so because saponification happens and due to the chelation of chelating of the calcium ions the calcium levels will be low right okay so that's why hypocalcemia can be seen hypocalcemia can be seen okay about chelating the calcium ions and all we'll talk about that later on so hypocalcemia it means lower level of calcium ions that is very very important question that's why i'm highlighting this point okay so usually it looks that there will be hypercalcemia in the acute pancreatitis patient but that is not the case you will be seeing the hypocalcemia in those patients okay fine okay ercp endo retro pancreatitis. just wait for some time i will talk about that okay fine now I'm just moving on to the radiological signs there, uh, which are very important over there. Okay, fine. Along with that, you can take the help of uh, liver function test also. There you will be seeing that ALT and AST levels might be raised. Right, that is the liver function test. Okay, fine. Now I'm coming to the radiological signs. Again, they are very important. They have been asked in the exams very, very commonly. So over here, let's talk about the radiological signs as well. So radiological signs, okay. Now, if you talk about radiological signs, right, then we are having very important one that is the colon cutoff sign. Colon cutoff sign, right. I will show you how it looks. Second one, we are having the sentinel, sentinel loop sign, okay, sentinel loop sign how it looks guys okay third one gasless abdomen 
okay and the fourth one you can see the renal halo sign all of these are your mcqs guys renal halo sign so what are the signs which you can see as far as radiological imaging is concerned what are the signs which you can see in the acute pancreatitis patient so these are the signs okay all of them has been asked in the past as far as acute pancreatitis is concerned so over here i'm just showing you different different signs over here okay so first of all uh, okay so these are some signs which we can talk about okay let me just arrange them okay till now everything is clear guys just let me know is everything clear till now Okay, fine, fine, fine. Pathophysiology, please explain. Okay, I will explain that. Fine. After this, I will explain the pathophysiology part as well. Okay, fine. fine. Any finding in USG as such? No, there is not such a uh, kind of finding. If we are not finding anything in the radiology part, okay, uh, then in that case, or if the patient is not suitable for the CT scan, for an example, then in that case, we might take the help of ultrasound. Okay. Fine. ERCP ka full form, I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. Don't worry about that. Okay, fine. So I was talking about the radiological signs over here. First sign which you can see over here that, you know, first of all, on the X-ray, just tell me how the air is actually looking. I told you in the trauma module as well, in the trauma uh, session as well, that uh, how the actually air or gas is looking on the X-ray. Is it black or is it white in color? Is it black or white in color? If you talk about the air on the X-ray or the gas on the X-ray, is it white or is it black in color? Yes, that is okay. Okay, very nice, very nice. Roy, the old gamer, it is radiation black. Very nice. Jivesh Sharma, black, black, black. Okay, very nice. Sanyasi, very nice. Cyanide. Excellent. Osama, Nandini, black. Okay, great. And yeah, very nice, everybody. So yes, it is looking black in color. So what you are seeing in this particular X-ray, okay? First of all, this is X-ray. So what you are seeing over here, that over here you can see some blackness over here. Then you can see some blackness here. You can see some blackness, okay? But in between, you can see there is there is no blackness. So this is gasless abdomen, right? So in very few part, if you are seeing the gas only in the abdomen, then this is called as the gasless abdomen. That is first sign which you can actually appreciate in the acute pancreatitis radiology or imaging, right? Second sign which you can see over here, that is the sentinel loop sign. So here we can see the multiple, here we can see the multiple loops, right? Multiple loops of gases, that is the sentinel loop sign. Okay, nobody will ask you the detail. You uh, you just need to know that how I'm just showing you that how these signs, signs are actually looking so that you can actually make an idea in your mind that how they are looking basically. Okay. Then next thing over here. Uh, yes. What is this sign? You can see that these are the kidneys guys. This is the CT scan image. This is the kidney. Right. And around the kidney, around the kidney, you are seeing black color. Around the kidney, what you can see? Black color. Around the kidneys, you can see the black color. So this is called as the renal halo sign, right? This is called as renal halo sign, renal halo sign. Okay. Again, this can be seen because perinephric in the around the naf uh, around the nephric area. I mean, around the kidneys. Okay, the fat will be accumulating over there. Due to that, the renal halo sign will be appreciated in the acute pancreatitis case. Yeah, very nice. Hello, hello, hello. Very nice, Doctor Benedict, Doctor. The end, very nice. Okay. Okay, fine. Now, so this is the renal halo sign which we can appreciate. Next sign, this is very, very important. This is the colon cutoff sign, right? So the probability of one sign which can come in your exam from the acute pancreatitis, if they want to ask you the radiological sign, then this is that sign. This is the colon cutoff sign, guys. Okay. So examiner, if he wants to pick the question from this particular part, then he might ask you what is colon cutoff sign. This is the colon cutoff sign. Here it is very easy to identify as well. You, you, what you can see over here that you can see the colon, right? You can see the colon very well. But over here, over here, what you can see there is cutting of this colon. There is cutting of this colon. 
okay after this part you can't appreciate in this area where is the column right so this is called as the column cutoff sign as if somebody cuts the column okay so that's why this is called as the column cutoff sign okay i hope all of these radiological signs are clear okay fine okay guys investigation of choice can somebody answer very nice investigation of choice very fast suddenly the colon shadow disappeared colon cut off sign yes yes exactly very nice Roy. investigation of choice guys for acute pancreatitis no 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 ERCP learn yes ECT very nice ECT uh Roy CT scan yes Dr. Benedict CT scan excellent Krishna ERCP no it's not ERCP investigation of choice will be your contrast and CT scan because we are using the contrast okay okay one answer one answer guys that will be the contrast and CT scan so investigation of choice would be the CECT scan okay one more question one more question over here CECT scan when will you do the CECT scan of the patient you should not do the CECT scan before 72 hours okay after 72 hours it means after three days i will be preferring to send my patient for contrast and ct scan why is it so because initially you might miss the findings initially we might miss the findings that's why we will we, we shall wait for three days and then if we will be going for the ct scan then we shall appreciate the findings in our patient okay as far as contrast and ct scan is concerned so we'll wait for three days wise okay so it is usually done after 72 hours usually done after 72 hours of symptoms okay fine clear then we are having some then we are having some criterias right then we are having some criterias for knowing the severity of acute pancreatitis right how severe the acute pancreatitis is we are having some criteria now there, there is a long list for those criteria guys okay which tells the severity of acute pancreatitis you just need to know the names only one criteria has been asked once or twice in the mcqs that what are the components of that criteria will come to that okay so if you talk about the assessment of severity of acute pancreatitis assessment of severity of acute pancreatitis i'm just writing ap acute pancreatitis okay fine okay Mehul Vajani X-ray. No, it's not X-ray. X-ray is not the investigation of choice guide. It is, it is CECT scan. Okay. Fine. Okay. Okay. Bicep. No, it's not the case. Now, a severity of acute pancreatitis, guys. How we can know about that? First one is your uh, modified Glasgow criteria. Modified Glasgow criteria. Modified glasgow criteria right second one which we can use that is the very important one that is the i'm just highlighting it with the uh you know bold letters that is the ramson's score or ramson's criteria ramson's score or ramson's criteria only this criteria has been asked in the past if you talk about what are the components of it i will tell you okay just wait then but at least you should know the names right you should know you you should not uh, know the detail actually that is not needed but at least you should know these names that's why i'm mentioning over here then third one is your crp now crp usually it should be less than five right in a normal scenario for example if you will be uh, doing your blood investigation right it would be coming less than five only because you are not uh, having the inflammation inside your body right now but let's say if you talk about these patients usually it is more than 150 usually it is more than 150 units per liter okay next you what we can talk about over here next one is the HAPS what is HAPS basically this is the harmless harmless acute pancreatitis score so harmless acute pancreatitis score pancreatitis right next one that is the bicep okay bicep is the bedside index bedside index for c 
सीवियरिटी ऑफ एक्यूट पैंक्रेटाइटिस सीवियरिटी ऑफ एक्यूट पैंक्रेटाइटिस ओके सो दीज आर सम साइंस ओवर हियर विच यू विच यू शैल टॉक अबाउट एज फार एज सीवियरिटी ऑफ एक्यूट पैंक्रेटाइटिस इफ यू वॉन्ट टू नो द सीवियरिटी राइट सो यूजली बाय द गेस्ट एंटेरोलॉजिस्ट दे विल बी एक्चुअली यूजिंग दीज पर्टिकुलर साइंस टू यू नो जस्ट गिव द ग्रेड टू द एक्यूट पैंक्रेटाइटिस राइट अलॉन्ग विद दैट वी शैल टॉक अबाउट द मॉडिफाइड पार्शल स्कोर ओके मॉडिफाइड मार्शल स्कोर फाइन सो दीज आर सम ऑफ द थिंग्स विच यू कैन टॉक अबाउट एज फार एज सीवियरिटी ऑफ द एक्यूट एक्यूट पैंक्रेटाइटिस इज कंसर्न सी रिएक्टिव प्रोटीन या दैट इज द फुल फॉर्म ऑफ सी आर पी दैट इज द फुल फॉर्म ऑफ सी आर पी दैट इज द सी रिएक्टिव प्रोटीन सी रिएक्टिव प्रोटीन इट इज द एक्यूट फेज रिएक्टेंट येस इट इज राइट ओके in any inflammatory response excellent roy the old gamer very nice the level of crp is raised in any kind of inflammation yes that is right okay fine now i'm moving on at last i'm moving on to the treatment modality over here for the treatment part that would be like how to manage the cases of acute pancreatitis right so for example you have diagnosed the acute pancreatitis case right so that is our first job second job would be to treat this particular patient right so usually i said that patient will be having repeatedly hiccups the patient will be coming up with the nausea vomiting and all of these things will be there repeated vomiting can be seen in this patient so what you need to do is so we are talking about the management part over here what we need to do over here in these cases right so we should not allow this patient to take anything orally right even will not allow this patient to take water also because uh, there is no use of that because the patient might vomit that out so in this case we'll keep the patient npo what is npo guys can somebody write in the chat box what is npo so we'll keep our patient npo okay what is npo guys is it a procedure with uh, people's procedure no it's not used over here nil per oral yeah nil per ross or nil per oral nil per mouth okay all of these are th same things so it is nil per ross or nil per oral right so that is the case so nil per oral that is the npo right we will not allow any uh, this patient to eat anything basically then after that we will actually give iv fluids to this patient now which iv fluid which crystalloid should i give to this patient that is the ringer lactate that is the rl or ringer lactate because it will make sure that electrolytes are actually maintaining in the body because the patient will be losing lot of electrolytes in the vomiting part so that's why to handle that we will be giving the iv fluids and which iv fluid will be giving are very nice very nice very nice dr benedict roy the old gamer osama very nice krishna it is rl yes very nice then iv fluid will be giving rl to tackle the vomiting part right obviously you will be giving the antimetics right obviously you will be giving the ondin citron to the patient or metoclopramide uh, for the vomiting part but to actually handle that vomiting part what we will be doing to the patient will we can actually insert the rice tube or which is also called as your ng tube that is the naso gastric tube yes very nice osama barad morphine sulfate morphine sulfate morphine is actually opioid guys it is used for uh, you know it is used for the pain management right to tackle the pain you can give this but rl uh, not the rl it is the ng tube or it is also called as the rice tube okay which can be inserted through the nose through the nostrils and with that so we'll do the ng tube insertion okay so to tackle the vomit part we can actually insert the ng tube now we can give some analgesics guys because obviously the patient will be in the having severe pain in the epigastric region so we'll give some analgesics for example what analgesics you can give for example morphine can be given to tackle the pain okay then for the nutrition part we are not allowing anything uh, we are not allowing anything orally right so for that case we can actually give the total parenteral nutrition epn total parenteral total parenteral nutrition okay so it's kind of a packet right which you can see the bedside uh, to the patient if you will be visiting the uh, ward actually if you are seeing the acute pancreatitis patient or some other patients also uh, the patients who are uh, not actually ready for getting anything to the mouth okay for prolonged period then uh, we are actually starting the tpn in those cases and usually we are actually 
uh, checking the weight of such patients as well that if the weight of these kind of patients are increasing or not okay tpn that is the total parenteral nutrition hartman solution yes this is that is only that is the rl only yes okay so now that is the total parenteral nutrition and after that we'll try to start the anteral nutrition okay once the patient will be settled down okay then we can start the anteral nutrition which means we'll try to give some things to the uh, patient orally right so we'll try to give some anteral nutrition okay because that is good for the patient recovery with that should i give antibiotic or not in these cases usually in the mild cases of acute pancreatitis uh, antibiotics role is not proven as such but for the severe pancreatitis obviously we should give the pancreatitis uh, we should give the antibiotics in those cases which antibiotics are actually good for those cases that is the meropenem that is the meropenem now meropenem guys it is the beta lactam antibiotic right this is the beta lactam antibiotic okay this is the beta lactam antibiotic okay so this antibiotic can be given to the patient if you are handling the severe pancreatitis case okay fine fine so this is the beta lactam antibiotic okay fine now moving for moving further now if you talk about the ERCP right ERCP okay for example it was gallstone induced pancreatitis it was gallstone induced pancreatitis so first of all the patient was having cholelithiasis and let's say uh, from the gallbladder what is cholelithiasis there are the stones in the gallbladder from the gallbladder the this actually came into the bile duct this actually through the cystic duct okay what dr krishna told you dr krishna told you about the yes told you about the about this part not me part so let's say this is the stone over here with the black color i'm just showing that let's say this is the stone over here so obviously okay it depends on the luck of the patient that it might travel into this particular cystic duct and from the gallbladder it might go into the common bile duct right so this stone might be present over here or this stone might be present over here right okay and through that it might actually go further as well so this can actually irritate the pancreas this can actually cause the irritation of the pancreas okay so that is the case okay root kya hoga this is not the, look we are having two roots right anterior and parenteral right if you are not allowing anything through the mouth that will be called as parenteral right okay so usually uh, we are giving that through the iv root okay for example iv root is also called as the parenteral im root is also called as the parenteral that is called as the parenteral root now look over here if the stone is coming in this particular common uh, common bile duct okay that can irritate the pancreas and that can cause the acute pancreatitis if that is the cause in those cases we can use the ercp modality we can use the ercp modality so what will be the purpose of using the ercp what is the purpose of using the ercp that will be the uh, removing the stones from the common bile duct okay so in the biliary tract if the stone has been stuck so in those cases we are using the ercp modality right so what is ercp guys ercp full form that is endoscopic so coming to that part ERCP, ERCP is endoscopic retrograde, endoscopic retrograde phalangeopancreatography, phalangeopancreaticography, okay, phalangeopancreatography, okay, this is the full form of ERCP, how is it looking actually, that's how the ERCP looks like, okay, okay, fine. So, okay. So, what we can see over here in this particular diagram, what is the idea? What is the idea? So, ERCP basically it is a procedure for the abnormalities of the bile duct usually, for the abnormalities of the bile duct, pancreatic duct, or the ampulla. So, if the stone has been stuck in these regions, okay, in these regions, then obviously we can use the ERCP to remove or to clear the ducts basically. Okay. So, what we'll be doing actually through the endoscope through the endoscope we will be going into the stomach first of all and through the stomach we will be entering into the duodenum and through the duodenum as you can see through the duodenum this is the endoscope you can see over here through the du duodenum will be actually going through the this major duodenal papilla okay which i have studied in the anatomy part right so through that you know here this is which duct guide which i am highlighting right now this is which duct which is coming this is which duct please name this duct 
name this duct name this duct guys which i have just mentioned there are two ducts right there are two ducts so name this duct very nice there and very nice duct of duct of version right okay major pancreatic duct nandini yes so main pancreatic duct yes so over here you can see what is this green color what is this green color duct that is the common bile duct so with that we can actually clear the stone which are actually stuck in the common bile duct which can stuck in the common bile duct or with that we can clear the stones which are actually present in the pancreatic duct right so that is the use of ercp so that's why we can use the ercp right okay right so here what you can see right if you will take the picture of the ercp right so this you can see this is the endoscope and this picture has already been asked in the exam several times right so usually how you can identify the ercp very very simple if you are seeing the endoscope okay if you are seeing the endoscope so this is the endoscope right this one is the endoscope right so if you are seeing the endoscope in your particular image then this is the ercp right so with that what they did is what they did is they went into the major duodenal papilla okay and this is the this is what this is the common bile duct and this could be the pancreatic duct okay so they can clear the stones from there okay right so that's why it is called as the endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography right we can see the cholangio part that is a common bile, bile duct also and we can see the pancreatic part also we can visualize the pancreatic duct as well that's why cholangiopancreatography okay or cholangiopancreatography okay we are doing this procedure endoscopically that's why endoscopic right we are doing it retrogradely we are going we are first of all moving forward into the duodenum and then going back so it is also called as a retrograde so endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreaticography okay i hope it is clear so that can be used but for every patient we can't use it for every patient we should not use it because i told you the ercp itself can cause the acute pancreatitis in some patients right so we should minimize the use of ercp okay if the patient is not needed then the patient then we should not actually do the ercp of such patients right it is not like every acute pancreatitis patient do not need the ercp okay do not need the ercp that should be very very clear okay fine now guys moving on from here okay so what what, what are the indications for using this ercp modality okay so indication could be like if the patient is having the cbd stones obviously common bile duct stones are there and that is irritating the pancreas causing the acute pancreatitis obviously go for it right or if the patient is having pain presentation more than for more than two days or for more than 48 hours obviously you can go for it right or if the patient is presenting with the obstructive jaundice right obstructive jaundice it means some kind of obstruction is there it means some kind of obstruction is there then it might be the possibility that uh, bile duct has been obliterated so in those cases they might go for ercp okay so you might go for ercp so these are the signs now if in case the patient is having pancreatitis and the patient is having cholelithiasis okay the patient is having the gallstones or if the patient is having cholecystitis so in those cases okay in those cases after treating the pancreatitis part okay we'll take the help of surgeon and surgeon should remove the gallbladder so we should do the cholecystectomy before discharge of this patient right so before discharge okay before discharge of the patient okay don't think that you have actually treated the pan acute pancreatitis now patient is fine but this acute pancreatitis recurrence can be seen if the gallbladder stones will be coming out into the biliary tract okay so that's why what we will be doing basically will First of all, we will be removing the gallbladder. So after discharge, if the patient is having gallstones, then cholecystectomy, cholecystectomy must be done so that there is no recurrence for that. Okay, so that there is no recurrence. Okay, fine. Okay, guys. Fine. So that was about the management part of the acute pancreatitis. Okay, so now we'll be taking the break. Okay, fine. So Parad is asking for repeat again. Okay, which part you do? Uh, you want me to repeat? Okay. 
okay guys just collect your doubts okay then after break we shall discuss them fine okay okay so after the break we'll be discussing about the inguinal region anatomy okay so that we shall discuss upon the hernia part okay so we shall discuss upon the inguinal hernia and the uh, the direct and the indirect hernia right so first of all the dr krishna will be telling about the uh, inguinal region anatomy so that you can understand about that and then we shall discuss uh, upon that anatomy on the basis of that anatomy we shall discuss the hernias part okay so thank you so much guys and uh, let's meet after a break okay how long will be the break about 10 minutes okay about 10 minutes
Hello guys, how are you? Right, so finally welcome back again guys. Barad, hi Barad, good evening Roy. Good evening. So let's not waste our time now. We shall directly uh, discuss the inguinal region. I will be discussing everything right so i think there are many ought to join so i'll be discussing everything right like uh, what is inguinal region good evening Daran again good evening uh what is inguinal region right uh what is inguinal canal what are the rings how are they formed layer by layer bit by bit right everything in detail we shall draw it and we shall write it okay okay osama sheikh hello osama saman maharaj you know we don't do these things all the time right guys so let us start let us start hope someone would satisfy the wish of chaman maharaj rather than me right so hello madhavan kuti hello <laughs> yeah right guys so let, let us start now let us start now guys so i think that might be a bot message i think so yeah hi satyam hi let us start Satyam now. Let us start now. So we shall be discussing regarding the inguinal. All of you know, I want all of you to pay attention here. Okay. We shall be discussing regarding inguinal region. We shall be focusing on the inguinal region. Okay. Now in the inguinal region, in the inguinal region, all of you know this basic thing. What is this basic thing? I have already taught you that we have got something called anterior superior iliac spine right so we have got something called as anterior superior iliac spine all of you know this right we have got something called as anterior superior iliac spine so you can see this vlog with mahavir hello you can see this right so this will be your anterior superior iliac spine and this is your anterior inferior iliac spine okay and what is this this is your pubic tubercle so all the way from anterior superior iliac spine till the pubic tubercle whatever ligament you have that is called as what inguinal ligament right so till here you might know this because we have discussed these things previously itself right so this is pubic crest pubic tubercle and pubic symphysis okay so look here from anterior superior iliac spine now this is very very important guys yes this was very clearly discussed right so now i'm going to add some points onto this okay i'm going to add some points onto this okay now this is called as the middle portion of the inguinal ligament what is this this is called as the mid inguinal point now this is the place where Whenever you put your finger on this mid inguinal point, you can palpate your femoral artery. Okay. So, this point you basically call it as the mid inguinal point. Right. So, this mid inguinal point is responsible for the palpation of which artery. So, you can palpate the femoral artery pulsations here. Femoral artery pulsations, you can palpate it here okay right now next important thing is that uh, just above just above this mid inguinal point all of you now concentrate here right so let them message here don't don't worry about that guys don't worry about that just ignore them right so just above this just above this we have got something called as just above the mid inguinal point all of you should remember the topography just above the mid inguinal point, we have got 
something called as deep inguinal ring right so this thing over here is called as deep inguinal ring right deep inguinal ring now uh, look here deep inguinal ring will continue downward like this deep inguinal ring is continuing downward and forward and finally deep inguinal ring is continuing downward and forward through a canal here right so what is the name of this canal guys the name of this canal is inguinal canal inguinal canal and finally inguinal canal is going to end up with a ring here this is called a superficial inguinal ring what is this this is called a superficial inguinal ring ir stands for inguinal ring very good cyanide very good very good superficial opening yes roy it is called as the superficial opening okay right so did you understood you can get an mcq from here did you understood everything now during the development during the development of the fetus so what basically happens is that all of you now concentrate at the picture which i'm drawing okay concentrate at this picture which i'm drawing right now so this is the anterior abdomen let us say this is the developing scrotum over here and this is the back side right the back of the patient okay now exactly here exactly here you have got something called as peritoneum okay now what is this picture is this a is this the picture of any animal no it is not a picture of any animal this is a human okay so this is the back region okay this is the buttocks i mean the gluteal region right and this is the scrotal sac scrotal sac this is a scrotal sac okay now what is this thing which you have drawn with the pink all of you concentrate now what is this thing which you have drawn with the pink here this is called as peritoneum this is called as peritoneum now on the tip of the peritoneum here you have got you have got a process like this right what is this process called as this is called as processus vaginalis what is this called as this is called as processus vaginalis now what is the function of processus vaginalis i'll tell you in a minute but one very important thing you need to know is that your testis is in the abdominal wall right now okay your testis is in the abdominal wall right now in this condition here now what will happen is that what will happen is that pay attention now yes satyam but right is peritoneum now what will happen is that there is something that is attaching the test is all the way to the scrotal sac okay there is some wire that is attaching the test is to the scrotal sac okay now what is this wire called as can anyone name it excellent roy excellent 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 right so this is called as gubernaculum this is called as gubernaculum now now look now look how will this picture transform okay now look at how this picture transforms okay now as i already told you we have got uh, the peritoneum like this right and the terminal part is called as the processus vaginalis right and and another important thing right now you need to know what is that important thing the gubernaculum which is attached to the testis this gubernaculum will pull the testis down okay this gubernaculum is catching hold of the testis and it is pulling the testis down so when it is pulling the testis down the testis comes all the way down into the scrotal sac and down here it is attached with the gubernaculum okay that's fine then uh, why did you discuss about process vaginalis why did i discuss about process vaginalis is that later on as the baby is developing what will happen is that this process vaginalis undergoes obliteration right the process vaginalis it disappears now how does this process vaginalis disappears look here very carefully normally what should happen is that this process is vaginalis whatever is this see this part this part is obliterated 
obliterated in the sense this part disappears like this it disappears like this and there is a little part that is left here clear so in this way it obliterates so this is the process vaginalis which is coming down all the way which is detaching from the peritoneum and it is coming down all the way and and look here very carefully now look here very carefully now this process is vaginalis will cover your testis like this this process is vaginalis will cover your testis like this is everyone clear Very good. Now look here. Now look here, all of you. Yeah, fine. Now look here. So processes vaginalis, processes vaginalis. Once it got separated from the peritoneum, now you should not call it as process vaginalis. Now you should call this as tunica vaginalis. Okay. Now you should call this thing as tunica vaginalis. Vaginalis. What is tunica vaginalis? Tunica vaginalis is the covering over this testis. Okay, fine. So, why are you telling us this thing? Why am I telling you this thing is that if, if, for example, if this obliteration has not happened, okay, if this, if this obliteration, yes, tunica vaginalis, all of you, now look here. If this obliteration has not happened, if this separation has not happened, and if the process vaginalis remains there persistently, this is called persistent processes vaginalis. If it remains there, then what will happen is that this would lead to a type of hernia called as indirect hernia. Okay. And this type of indirect hernia is more common in females when compared to the males. Clear? So can I make a note here? Can I make a note here? Can I make a note here that persistent Processes vaginalis. Persistent process vaginalis would lead to a hernia. Very good, guys. Very good. Barad, Barad, you are excellent. Very good. It would lead to indirect hernia. It would lead to indirect hernia. Okay. So, this is the most, 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 most important MCQ, guys, which you need to know. Very, very, very important. Okay. Next important thing which I already told you was this one, the initial part. Now, now, the most important MCQ which I will be telling you, that will, that is more important than the previous two things which I have discussed. Because anywhere you go guys, any exam you go, if they want to ask you a question regarding this, definitely you will have a question on this topic which I am discussing right now, which I will be discussing it in a minute. Okay, now what is that? All of you pay attention now. Now this is your childhood, right? So this is you who are standing here. Now, here, let us say you have got this thing. This is called as your inguinal ligament. Okay, this is your inguinal ligament. And obviously, this will be your pubic symphysis like this. Clear? Now, what did I tell you previously? I told you previously that just above the inguinal ligament from the middle point here just above this I have got deep inguinal ring and after that I have got inguinal canal and after that I have got superficial inguinal ring right. So this is called as a deep this is called as the superficial one. Now you might now one very important thing you have to know is that what stage of this development right in the embryology at what stage of the fetal development is the testis located in the upper abdomen you know testis basically they are located in the upper abdomen and they descend down into the scrotal sac so at what age at what age or at what week more more precisely at what week it is in the upper abdomen it is in the seventh week okay it is in the second month or seventh week this can be a question now listen very carefully before i go to the next thing okay now when is this testis which is in the abdomen is descending down to the inguinal region 
when this testis descends down into the inguinal region can anyone tell at what age period does this testis descend down to the inguinal region Ra? yes during which week of development any idea guys any any idea uh, barad not one year it is too long Not seven months, Osama Sheikh, you are near to that. Actually, it descends down. Actually, it descends down at third month. At third month. Okay? At third month. Fine? Now, all of you, all of you look here. At third month, it will descend down. Now, after descending down, after descending down, at which week of development will the testis enter into the inguinal canal? You know, testis will enter into the inguinal canal. So, at which week of development will the testis enter into the inguinal canal? So, which means I am actually telling you this thing. At which week of development will it enter into the inguinal canal? So, at which week, come on, that would be your seventh month. Seventh month, okay? At which month of development that would be seventh month. So finally, finally, after seven months, right? After seven months, right now your testis is in the inguinal canal. Fine. Now, but if if the testis is in the inguinal canal, then that that is of no use, right? So down we have got your beautiful scrotal sacs here. Final testis has to descend down into the scrotal sac. So that is the final agenda, right? That that is the final gist. How many days will it take for this test is to, to pass through this inguinal canal? Inguinal canal is this big. Seventh month it entered here. How many days will it take to pass down all the way till where? Till the superficial inguinal ring. So how many days will it take for this thing, for this test is to pass down guys? It would roughly take around three to four days. It would roughly take around three to four days to pass. Okay, fine. So finally, your test is, is somewhere here. So finally, after three to four days, it passed. Now, at which month of development is the test is gonna enter directly into the scrotal sac? Yes, at which month? Very good, Bharat. Three to four days, you're right. Now tell me at which month will it directly enter into the scrotal sac, guys? Anyone, any idea? Yes, very good, Osama Sheikh, you're perfect. Very good, Roy, you're perfect. It enters into the scrotal sac at ninth month of age. Now, guys, you have two ways to study this. One way is by writing in the form of a sentence that at which month or a week it is in the abdomen, when it will descend down, right? When it will enter into the inguinal canal, how many days it will take to pass. So these things you can uh, study there. Right? Or else, if you draw a picture like this, that would be very, very easy for you to understand. So, I hope you understood this. And there is, need not, there is no need to tell that how many MCQs might be asked from this. Because everything can be a question here. Isn't it? Clear all, all of you? Right? Now, before I go a little bit deeper into the topic, are you all clear? Right. So now we are discussing, now we are discussing layers of abdomen. Now we are discussing layers of abdomen. Now why are you discussing layers of abdomen and why don't you discuss about the inguinal region? Inguinal region itself is formed by few layers of abdomen. So first of all, you have to know that. All of you now pay at most attention to whatever I'm teaching you. The outermost layer, the outermost layer will always be skin. Okay, this is the outermost layer. For example, if you are cutting one by one, one by one layer, if you are cutting inside me, the outermost layer will be the skin. After that, you know, there will be subcutaneous fat, right? So that is another part. After that, you will have superficial fascia, isn't it? So this is called as the skin. Don't worry, I'll write all of them down. So this is called as your skin. After the skin, you have got a next important thing that is called as superficial fascia. 
okay so let us say let us say this thing which i'm drawing right now this is called a superficial fascia actually actually there are two superficial fascia now what are can anyone tell what are the two superficial fascia yes what are the two superficial fascia which are located in your abdomen anyone guys any answer Osama Sheikh has already answered. Excellent, Roy. Perfect, Roy. Very good. Very good and very good. There are two layers. The outer one is called as camphor fascia and the inner one is called as carpus fascia. Okay. So let us say, let us say whatever I have drawn right now. So this outer one over here, this is called as carpus fascia. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. I, I'm. I'm mistaken here. I'm sorry. So the outermost, the most superficial layer will be the camphor. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. It will be the camphor fascia. Much more deeper here. Much more deeper. I will have. What will I have? Much more deeper. I will have. Scarpa's fascia. So both of them constitute the superficial fascia okay so can i write it down here the first layer will be the skin after that we have got superficial fascia and superficial fascia is divided into two the outer one is called as camphor fascia and the lower one is called as carpus fascia clear fine thank you roy thank you for correcting me thank you so much next important thing next important thing is that after the fascia we have got muscles so what are the so what are the muscles which we have here listen very carefully now listen very carefully to all the muscles which i'm teaching you now okay right so look here we have got we have got a muscle all the way here okay the same muscle is located on the other side isn't it whatever muscles we have on the left we even have on the right so what is this muscle here anyone what is this muscle over here yeah okay i'll name this muscle i'll name this muscle as one okay i'll name this muscle as one just above this just above this i have got another muscle here i have got another muscle on either side so I will name this muscle as 2. I will name this muscle as 2. And just above this, I have got a third muscle here. I have got a third muscle. I will name it as 3. Okay. I will name it as 3. Now, look here very carefully. Look here very carefully. What is the muscle? What is the first muscle? Very good. You have answered. This is external oblique muscle. You have got that is external oblique muscle. What is the second muscle? After external, you have got internal oblique, right? So internal oblique muscle. Internal oblique muscle. After internal oblique, after internal oblique muscle, what is the next muscle which you have? Anyone? Not rectus femoris. Osama, this is not the femur. Very good, Roy. The third muscle is transverse abdominis transverse abdominis transverse abdominis okay very good all of you very good this is transverse abdominis fine no no worries no worries osama now what i want you to know is that wherever this second muscle is located that is the internal oblique just nearer to that we have got in the same line we have got another muscle now this muscle here guys this muscle is very straight and it is located in the abdomen region here all the way like this this is called as rectus femoris muscle i am naming this muscle as a okay a stands for rectus sorry not rectus femoris it is rectus abdominis right you know even i started to follow uh, osama sheikh and tell that it is rectus femoris it is rectus abdominis rectus abdominis clear yes 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 now 
now now look here all of, all of you superficial fascia after that i have got external oblique muscle after that i have got internal oblique muscle sir we know this why are you writing it again because these are the things which are continuing with your testis okay how are they are in continuation with your testis i'll tell you in a minute but before that after internal oblique muscle i have got another muscle that is called as transverse abdominis okay after transverse abdominis what is the muscle i have got guys i don't have any muscle after transverse abdominis i have got transverse fascia transverse fascia and after transverse fascia i will end up having parietal peritoneum parietal peritoneum so naming these layers are very 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 easy okay so it will be the skin superficial fascia next you have got the muscles external internal transverse okay external internal transverse its fascia and finally peritoneum the parietal peritoneum after that you will have the visceral peritoneum okay so if you remember this guys you will solve many 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 mcqs many 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 mcqs okay now can you tell me something more important about this look here very carefully all of you all of you should pay attention now yeah look here the second muscle that is internal oblique muscle surrounding the internal oblique muscle we have got a sheath surrounding the internal oblique muscle we have got a sheath now that sheath is divided into two parts what are those two parts so it is divided into a superficial sheath like this it is divided into superficial sheath okay it is also divided into deep sheath so there are two sheaths here one is called as superficial another one is deep so whatever it is towards the skin that will be superficial whatever is away from the skin that is deep sheath in the same way in the same way even muscle one also has contributed its part muscle one is external oblique now external oblique is also having a sheath but that sheath look here that sheath covers only the anterior surface of this muscle and what is the name of this muscle that is rectus abdominis okay rectus abdominis so external oblique muscle is having a sheath that covers only the anterior surface of rectus abdominis but whereas internal oblique muscle it has a sheath that covers both anterior and posterior surface of your rectus abdominis muscle clear so far next important thing then what about the third muscle yes third muscle is also having a sheath but third muscle is contributing a sheath from the front side like this and it is covering the posterior side only it is covering the posterior side of the rectus abdominis muscle okay so external oblique is complete opposite of what external oblique is complete opposite of transverse abdominis muscle clear everyone now we have got many sheets here if you can if you can identify here uh, we have got this one is called as a posterior sheath this is called as a posterior sheath and this is called as both anterior posterior sheath and the lower blue one is called as anterior sheath so all these three sheets all these three sheets on either side on either side together they form something called as rectus sheath rectus sheath why are you calling it as rectus sheath because you are covering rectus femo rectus abdominis muscle right clear now what will you all of you now pay attention what will you call to that rectus sheath which is located in the center here you see in the center also we have got this rectus sheath between these muscles between the abdom between the rectus abdominis muscles also you have got this what is this called this is called as linea alba very good roy daran sai excellent daran very good dr bendict all of you are real pros this is called as linea alba this is called as linea alba clear now i think there is no need for you to tell what are the layers because by now you have all understood what are the layers which we have clear 
ऑल ऑफ यूर क्लियर या नाउ लुक हियर सर इन द स्टार्टिंग यू हैव टोल्ड मी दैट ऑल द लेयर्स ऑफ द एबडोमेन all the layers of the abdomen you told me they are continuous with the testis now how are they continuous with the testis look here all of you should pay attention now what is the outermost layer on my abdomen skin so this is my skin okay now skin will continue down into the scrotal sac like this this is my skin that is continuing down so till here till here it is the abdominal part till here it is the abdominal part but this entire thing is the scrotal part scrotal part okay what i'm trying to explain you is that this is called as abdominal skin and this is called as scrotal skin that is called as abdominal skin the next one is called as the scrotal skin okay now look here we have got another important thing that is called as the fascia Now look here. We have got after the skin. What what are the things we discussed after the skin? I told you there is superficial fascia. Look here. This blue one is a superficial fascia all the way till here. But once it crosses this line, once it enters into the scrotal sac, you should no more call it as superficial fascia. Rather, you should call it as dartosus muscle. What you should call it as dartosus muscle. Okay. so the next one the next one the next one it is superficial fascia okay I'm, i'll write it down here i'll write it down here itself so superficial fascia is equivalent to dartos clear now look at the third important thing after superficial fascia what did we discuss we discussed that there is something called as external oblique muscle so let me draw it with the red one so this muscle here this is called as external oblique muscle external oblique muscle till here but once it crosses the line it is not called as external oblique muscle in the scrotum it is called as external spermatic fascia what is it called it is called as external spermatic fascia see this red one is called as external spermatic fascia so can i write down here that external oblique muscle is in continuation with external spermatic fascia external spermatic fascia right now the next muscle is internal oblique muscle so can you please tell me anything about internal oblique muscle okay look here so this is the internal oblique muscle now the internal oblique muscle comes till here right now internal oblique muscle ends here now once this internal oblique muscle enters into the scrotum you should not call it as internal oblique rather you should call it as cremastic fascia right what is this called cremaster fascia so internal oblique is called as cremaster fascia okay now obviously in the same way transverse abdominis okay transverse abdominis is called as what nothing because the continuation of transverse abdominis into the scrotum is not present transverse abdominis is only limited to your abdomen not to the scrotum okay next what about transverse fascia transverse fascia is equivalent to internal spermatic fascia internal spermatic fascia and what about parietal peritoneum there is nothing about parietal peritoneum very good very good barad excellent barad so this box which i have drawn is very very important guys you should know the layers right what are these layers in continuation with the testis in the testis what do you call them that is very important so comparison i have written it down here this is very 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 important guys okay and all of you know all of you know in the center we have got our testis and starting i explained you surrounding the testis there was something what is that called as anyone
so in this way guys you can know the layers of testis also you can know the layers of abdomen also because you need not to study it separately right so this is all in continuation so you can know it very good sanyasi pandit it is called as tunica vaginalis yes very good so surrounding this there was there was something like this this is called as tunica vaginalis very good very good very good tunica vaginalis okay now now we have discussed the brief introduction we have discussed what are the layers now we shall discuss how superficial inguinal ring is formed how deep inguinal ring is formed okay now we shall discuss that important thing now now all of you all of you should pay attention to this picture over here now what is this picture look here this bone which you can see here this is your pubic bone right and i have already told you that I have already told you look here i have already told you that let us say this is your external oblique muscle okay all of you look here this is your external oblique muscle now in this external oblique muscle okay this is your external oblique in this external oblique we have got two parts this is called as the upper part this is called as the lower part what did i tell you the lower part will fold inside like this it will fold inside like this to form a ligament here this ligament is called as what is this ligament this is called as inguinal ligament okay this is called as inguinal ligament the same thing has happened here look here this muscle whatever i have uh, written here this is called as external oblique muscle okay external oblique muscle now in this external oblique muscle there are two parts i told you so this part is called as the superior part okay this part is called as the inferior part now the inferior part has enfolded itself inside and formed this ligament over here which you can see very clearly in a double line this is called as inguinal ligament this is called as inguinal ligament now the question which are they which they are gonna ask you in the exam now what is this all of you look here all of you pay attention so one is superior one is inferior then what will be anterior and posterior see this is anterior this is posterior this is posterior clear now if i ask you where is inguinal ligament present now how will you tell me inguinal ligament is present between anterior border and the inferior border isn't it antero inferiorly i have got inguinal ligament right so what am I writing here? Antero inferiorly, I have got inguinal ligament. Not only inguinal ligament, antero inferiorly, I have also got one more important thing. If you can pay close attention here, antero inferiorly, there is a defect here. You see there is a defect right so if this is the muscle if i make a hole here that will become the defect of this muscle so that defect whatever is there that is called a superficial inguinal ring so this defect on the external oblique muscle which is located antero inferiorly is called as superficial inguinal ring superficial inguinal ring superficial inguinal ring did everyone understood whatever I have taught here now? Yeah. We are about to end guys. We are about to end this session. But did everyone understood whatever I have taught here? Right. After external oblique muscle, what is the next muscle we have? After external oblique muscle, we have got internal oblique so this is external oblique now i'm removing this external oblique now you can see internal oblique okay now this muscle whatever you can see this is called as internal oblique now look at this internal oblique muscle guys all of you all of you look at this internal oblique the fibers are like an arch the fibers here they are like an arch isn't it so these fibers of internal oblique muscle they are called as arcuate fibers 
arcuate fibers okay sir but on the top they are like an arch but what is this what is this canal this canal is nothing but called as inguinal canal and whatever is coming out of inguinal canal is nothing but called as spermatic cord so can i tell this as a spermatic cord yes spermatic cord then what about this this is called as inguinal canal Nowadays, the examiners have also been asking, can you please tell me, what are the borders of inguinal canal? Yeah, when it comes to the level of internal oblique muscles, how does internal oblique muscle cover the inguinal canal? Look here very carefully, all of you. We have got three borders of inguinal canal. This, let me show it to you like this. Let me put different colors. So we have got three colors here. What are those three colors? One is called as the green color. One is called as the green color. Green color is forming the anterior border of inguinal canal. Next we have got the red color. Red color is forming the superior border of inguinal canal. And we have got the pink color that is forming the posterior border of inguinal canal. So internal oblique muscle covers the inguinal canals through three borders anterior superior and posterior clear all of you before i switch to the next very good now uh, this is internal oblique muscle after internal oblique muscle i will have what muscle yes which muscle transverse abdominis so this muscle over here is called as transverse abdominis muscle after transverse abdominis muscle after transverse abdominis muscle which muscle will i have will i have any muscle or will i have a fascia after transverse abdominis what will i have very good dr bendict i will have transverse fascia see this is transverse fascia okay if you if you want a proof Look at this picture over here. This is a muscle. When you remove this muscle, you can see dotted lines behind that. Dotted lines is nothing but the fascia. Now I have removed the muscle and the fascia is here. Okay. I have removed the muscle and the fascia is here. But you know what is the interesting thing here? What is the interesting thing is that on the fascia, I have a small defect, very small defect. And through this defect, defect in the sense a small hole, guys in our you know layman language just remember it as a small hole a small hole is called defect right so there is a small hole on the transverse fascia through which the spermatic cord is coming out and this is called as deep inguinal ring deep inguinal ring okay so the last important thing i want to tell you is that the last important thing guys just for your understanding only the last important thing look here this is this is let us say external oblique muscle okay this is transverse fascia now they are not exactly above each other they are little bit oblique with each other external oblique muscle transverse fascia okay now uh, dr shubham will hold it external oblique muscle and transverse fascia i told you there is a hole here that hole is on the top so it is called superficial there is a hole here that hole is called as a deep hole so this is a superficial inguinal ring that is a deep inguinal ring now in between these inguinal rings there is a canal that is passing this canal is called inguinal canal now through this inguinal canal there is a white color cord that is passing this is called spermatic cord clear that's it okay so we shall continue regarding uh, this session if you like this integrated session guys then we shall continue this integrated sessions further and further and further okay so i will be uh, discussing uh, still more some important things about this inguinal region and dr shubham will continue about the inguinal surgeries inguinal hernia and all the clinical part okay so guys tell me that did you understood everything clearly was this session worthy guys
थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू धरन थे धरन साय थैंक यू बराड थैंक यू सनिया सी थैंक यू ओसामा शेख थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू ऑल ऑफ यू राइट गाइज गुड बाय एंड हैव ए गुड नाइट थैंक यू गाइज